educate and stimulate you enough so that you will take action afterward and help change and make Arizona blue, which is the topic of our speech, our, our presentation today. Uh, before we get started, I promised Kim Watson, who is our pre, one of our preceding coordinators, that he would have a first opportunity to make an announcement. Is he around? There he is. And he's in the back of the room, so turn around and look at Kim. Very briefly, anyone who is interested uh, in becoming a PC or learning more about the being a precinct committee person, I'll hang around at the end of the uh, session today. Glad to talk to you about that because we need all the help we can get. Absolutely. We, we hope you'll say that you were stimulated by the luncheon here to join and become a PC. Um, Ed, you have an announcement? Yes, uh, a lot of people have uh, said they are boycotting downtown because of the, the meters, but we have a uh, small business Saturday coming up uh, the day after uh, the, the, the Saturday after Thanksgiving. So uh, what we're trying to do is uh, ask the city to not to turn the meters off anyway that day. So if you can email city council, and the parking manager, Carl Elberhardt, and ask them to turn the meters off on small business Saturday. It would really help our downtown small businesses. Yes. And we all want to support our small businesses. Um, finally, Lon. Oh. I just wanted to invite you, probably got an invitation to the gubernatorial candidate uh, meet and greet that's going to be at our home tomorrow night at 530. If you haven't gotten it, you are invited anyway. And uh, Steve Farley is somebody who we are very excited about uh, with his knowledge of the legislature and with his uh, very strong support for public education and funding it at a level that's uh, good for our state as well as many other policy issues. We are very enthusiastic about it. So if any of you would like, we do have some flyers up here uh, that give you our address and the time, and <coughs> we'll be glad to share it with you. Hope you can come. And you understand the party is officially neutral until after the primary, but we support all of our candidates. And thank you, Ron. <laughs> See you. you. Appreciate it. Um, uh, Kelsey wants to remind you that you need to sign in, please. We want to make sure you get on the mailing list so you can make the next uh, series of discussions. In Jane, we're not going to do anything in, at Christmas except uh, the Christmas party. And if you haven't gotten a notice, uh, tell someone who's in the party. Uh, in January, we will have, on um, it's the third Thursday every month. In January, it will be Dr. Good, or is it Goody? Who's with the Ethnic Studies? Gooding. Gooding. I've misspelled it now four different ways. Um, we'll be talking about Ethnic Studies and the work they're doing here in Flagstaff. We will have um, Tom Collins, and I think some of you know him. He's the Director of Clean Elections in March. In February, I'm trying to get a licensed psychiatrist who will review the new book on Donald Trump's mental condition. <laughs> I just thought it'd be kind of a kid. What do you think? Somebody said we got to do that one at happy hour. So I'm throwing that open. Make your comments known and your attitudes known uh, about whether you think we ought to do that at a happy hour or do it at lunch. So um, with no further ado, it's my great pleasure. Wait just a minute. Let me finish. Uh, my great pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Fred Solop, who's been the past president of the NAU Political Science Department and is a uh, guest lecturer around the world, is what, what, what I hear. He goes to Spain for a whole, whole year, so it's wonderful. As political scientists, we've been reading since at least the 90s about the fact that the Southwest is going to turn and change demographically. This has been in academic literature. It was, it was in the academic literature I was reading when I was a graduate student, so you know how long ago that was. Um, and so the demographics have been changing. Certainly the Southwest is changing. And now you see blue bands on Democrats. It says, turn Arizona blue. And the question that Fred Solop will answer for us is, are we ever going to turn Arizona blue? Give us a hand, please. Thank you.
you for inviting me to speak today. Um, it's always a pleasure to get outside the university and to speak to people who are on the ground thinking about these issues, motivated, working on these issues. Um, Harriet has asked me to talk about is Arizona blue, going blue, when is it going blue? And um, I really want to take two different lines of argumentation here, so just kind of hang in there with me. Um, the, first, the first answer is yes, but. <laughs> the, the second answer is are we asking the right question? And so those are the two kind of directions I want to pursue today. And uh, I really invite your questions. I'll, I'll talk, Harriet said maybe a half hour, but I'll talk like 15 minutes or so. Then I'll open up for questions. I really Good. appreciate facilitating. Can we the volume or hold the is that, closer? Should I hold it closer? Yeah. Yes. Okay. It's, it's weird because there's like no cord here or something. Anyway, we'll, <laughs> we'll, we'll see what we can do. We'll make it work. Um, the, the first answer is yes, but. Okay. We, as, as Harriet said, we've been talking about this for quite some time. Uh, we've been talking. When did you go to graduate school? I'm we not talking. talking. About, okay. <laughs> we, we've been Before talking about this. Before most of you were born. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so. Um, we've been talking about this for for many decades. That demographics are changing, especially in the Inner Mountain West. That um, we we see rapid population growth. We see increasing uh, economic development, increasing diversification of the population. We see generational replacement. You know, younger or older voters are, are dying off, frankly. Younger voters are coming in. They tend to be more open to diversity and different ideas. So the demographic shifts are changing. They are occurring. We know in Arizona today that uh, Latinos are the fastest growing segment of the population. They're roughly a third of the Arizona population <coughs> and growing more rapidly. We know that that's a younger demographic. As that demographic gets older, they will come into the electorate. So there's, there's a lot going on there. However, even though we've been talking about this for decades, Latino participation actually decreased in the last presidential election. In, in Arizona. So we have to be careful about what is actually going on here, what is actually taking place. Um, just because the population is moving in one direction doesn't mean the political system is moving in that same direction. And, uh, and, and I draw your attention to polarization. We all know that we're in a more, more polarized society. Um, I was going to show a chart a little later showing how polarized the Democrats are and the Republicans are, how, how they've moved ideologically toward the, the outside of the spectrum. They're no longer in the center. We know that's taking place at the same time that the population is actually quite centrist. If you do public opinion surveys, and I do public opinion surveys, and you look at questions like gun control or abortion, gay marriage, the, the, the population, generally speaking, is very centrist. And they, they deviate just maybe getting a little more liberal on some issues, getting a little more conservative on some issues, but we're quite centrist. But yet, the, our elites, our political system is moving quite far to the extremes. So the, the system doesn't necessarily reflect the population, nor would it fairly reflect the population changes taking place. We have some particular challenges in Arizona. Arizona is one of those roughly 26 states where there's a trifecta for the Republicans. They control the um, the governor's house, you know, the governor, they control the two houses of Congress. And more states have gone in this direction over time. The Republicans have done a great job organizing people at the grassroots. The Democrats, as you know, just preaching to the choir here, the Democrats lost a lot of state seats in the Obama, during the Obama administration and uh, really took a step back. Arizona has some particular challenges. So, so even though some of the states around us that used to be solid red are going blue, you know, even though we see some changes taking place in Nevada and Colorado, for instance, uh, New Mexico, Arizona still has, has stayed pretty, pretty much in the red column. So what does it mean to go blue? Does it mean, there are all kinds of articles in the last presidential election. If we elect Hillary Clinton, if Arizona went for Hillary Clinton, then Arizona's going blue. 
Is that, is that the same thing? We went for Bill Clinton in 1996. That was the last time we voted for a Democrat since 1952. I think we've been Republican since the 1948 election. We voted Democrat once, 1996. Would you have said Arizona's going blue because we, we voted for Bill Clinton? No, you wouldn't say that. It's gonna take a, a larger change. But Arizona has particular challenges which limit that, those changes from taking place. For instance, we have a very unusual legislative system. We have multi-member uh, legislative districts where we, we elect two members for the House from each legislative district. And our Senate districts are the same districts as the House districts. That's a particular structure by which we choose our, our uh, elected officials. That particular structure lends itself to more ideological orientation. So the ideologues have a, have a step up. We, we also know that um, we have very mobilized populations. We're an ALEC state. We all know what ALEC is. Where uh, uh, we have a governor and a, a corporation commission and uh, many legislatures who are very comfortable with dark money or a dark money state. So we, we have gone in some clean election areas. You know, we have clean elections. Um, we're very early to have uh, uh, mail registration. Um, we, we've had some good government initiatives, but generally speaking, we have a structure in place which limits the, uh, the, the linkage between the system, the, the political system, and the people. So, if we're going to break anything, we have to think about the structure. That's what the yes, the demographics are changing. But the structure is limiting the relationship between those demographic changes and the policies that people are being elected. So that's the, uh, the yes but. Lots of challenges in Arizona. Not to say they're not going to be overcome. When's it going to happen? We're in, in a, a couple decades, we're going to be uh, what's called a majority-minority state. Things are going to change. There's no doubt about it. Things always change. Things are going to change. We used to be a democratic state. We used to be a progressive state. And then we turned red. And now we've pulled back from being as solid red as we once were. So the change has already started. We're not going to see it significantly. Uh, I think it's going to be quite some time, many more election cycles. So that's the, that's the yes, but there's a lot of work to do. Let me give you a more difficult answer. And this, this is one I've been just, uh, just discussing with my classes, and I appreciate the opportunity to discuss it here. I want to take you down a different, a different uh, uh, avenue here, a different avenue of thinking. We, we've all seen, uh, and I have a, uh, we've, we've all seen the um, uh, Piketty's uh, graph on income inequality in the United States. I know you can't see that in the back of the wall. Income inequality in the United States. That inequality was quite high in uh, the 20s, the 30s, and the, into the Depression. Income inequality dropped significantly in the post-war period, different economy. Um, and then income inequality has been on the rise since the mid-80s. And today, income inequality looks much like it did prior to the Depression. Is everybody familiar with that graph? Yeah. Okay. So there's another graph which, of course, you can't see, but it's party polarization. The, the graph is the same graph. It's virtually the same graph. Thank you. It's virtually the same graph. Now, we talk about polarization today, but we never link that question of polarization to income inequality. Those two graphs track each other almost perfectly. That there was polarization, <coughs> excuse me, there was polarization into the depression. Post depression, there was a consensus. Uh, post war, there was a consensus in this country. And then since the 80s, we've increased polarization. Those two graphs track perfectly. So we need to talk about what that means. What's happening? Let's take a look. And how is polarization? linked to income inequality. Well, one thing we can say is, in the, in the vein that change always happens, that ec the economy has been changing significantly. We are in a different economic situation today than we had been post-war. 
uh, this, this consensus that existed post-war, this, this is the consensus that uh, I'm gonna link Harry and myself together because we, we both studied uh, political science in graduate school. We, we were socialized to believe that this consensus is really the way things are in this country. And, and this polarization going on today is a deviation from that consensus. We have to work to come back to the consensus. Right? That's, that's the thinking in this country. We need bipartisanship when it comes to uh, legislation. We need to, um, uh, we want, we were critical of Donald Trump because his, his public approval ratings are in the high 30s. 30, what are they, 38 today, 37, 38? They're, they're stuck there, they're flat. And the, the thinking is, the assumption is, pre presidential approval ratings should be high because that would represent consensus. Consensus comes out of a different economy. It comes out of an economy that, um, that, that was really based on the social welfare consensus that emerged um, out of the Depression. We, we developed a form of capitalism where there was basically an agreement, an understanding that businesses would go forward, labor unions were strong, there would be a social welfare system to pick up the slack, to, to help out people who really needed it. But that economy that we were socialized into thinking that's the way the world runs, that's the consensus that we're all looking for. We, should, we need to go back to consensus. We can't go back to consensus. We can't go back to that economy. That economy no longer exists. So we've moved from that liberal social welfare economy to what we now call neoliberalism, right? That's a word that gets thrown around a lot. We have a neoliberal economy. The economy has changed. We have an economy that looks at markets as natural. That's the logic, it's a market logic, and we're gonna apply that to everything. We have an economy that values privatization. We have an economy that, val that, that devalues security, security at home. And now we have the rise in, you know, I, I work with young people all the time. They don't really, for the most part, they don't believe they're gonna go in, they're gonna leave the university and go into an economy and have a secure job with benefits like their parents do. That concept of social mobility that we were all socialized into, right? This is a great country. Anybody who works hard can make it. You can do better than your parents. You can own a home. You can, you can provide for your, your family. That, that consensus orientation doesn't exist for young people today. They're now in what we call the precarious. They're in a precarious position. They don't expect to have health benefits. They don't expect to have uh, a steady job that they're gonna work in for decades. We, I was just talking to Lon. Lon, how many years were you at NAU? 37. 37, I'm on my 27th year at NAU. It does, or no, 28th year. It's, that image doesn't exist for young people today to imagine they could be in a job for their long. So the economy has changed. Again, privatization, market logic, deregulation, Reduce taxes, we've cut back the government, we've shrunk the government. The government can no longer respond to the demands from the public, can no longer respond to the needs of the public. So we have a crisis of what's called a crisis of legitimacy. We have disaffection, people don't trust government anymore. Remember I said the population's been pretty centrist in public opinion on all those issues. When you look at public opinion, slightly liberal, slightly conservative, pretty centrist on all dimensions except one. The one dimension where the public has significantly changed is trust in government. Trust in government, do you, tr you, know, do, do you trust the government to do the right thing? Do you trust Congress? Do you trust your, your president? Plummet, disaffection. So the economy has changed. We're in this neoliberal moment and we've changed. Our identities have changed. We have to recognize that we are different people today. We, our identities, we say, are more fragmented. They're going into different directions. We don't have the, the solid middle strata of organizations. Civil society is diminished. We don't have that, that middle group of organizations to absorb the shock. So we're, we're left kind of floundering out there. And we need to find a new direction. We're really looking for a new direction. And so I would argue that as we think about the future, 
maybe we need to break this idea of going back to the period of consensus, of going back, of thinking that we need to be doing everything for everybody. We need to go back in time. That is a, that doesn't exist. That 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 time is past. We have to move on. We're in a polarized period, a polarized period linked to an economic structure that is forging inequality, and we have to adjust to that. I would argue, I would put before you, the Republicans are doing that. The Republicans are making that adjustment. And we, we, we say how horrible it is that Trump is, uh, is angry and he belittles people and he diminishes people. Remember his 38%? That's been rock solid. I think he's happy with that 38%. I think he's happy with that, because we're now polarized. He's captured his polarized community, and he's mobilizing them now, and he's consolidating that community to move forward. We all think, oh, how horrible, 38%. Approval rating, I think he's happy with that. I think he's just fine with that. And I think progressives, and I can say everybody in this room, I think we are in the wrong mindset. That we're looking to get back to this moment of consensus. But that's not the way power works. Power is about putting ideas out there. Power is about forging a different consensus, thinking of a different way, bringing in new groups. Groups that right now we're going in different directions. We talk about identity movements. We have the, the feminist movement. We have the, the Black Lives Matter movement. We have the environmental movement. We have all these movements out there, which are, and I study social movements. I'm teaching a class on social movements this semester. I love social movements. It's, um, it's an important part of our political system. But what's gonna tie all these people together? What sort of vision? We can't be just going in different directions. We need a new vision. We need a new argument. Again, the Republicans have put that forward. They've put together a new vision. They define new winners and losers, new insiders, new outsiders. They're mobilizing that power. They're implementing that power. They're affecting policy. What's countervailing? What's on the other side? What's the counter? We would, in political science, we would say counter hegemony. What's, what's challenging that? The Democrats need to find that vision. The progressives need to find that vision. And I would argue that vision isn't going back and doing things the way we used to do it. We need to find a new way to do it. Um, and I, I don't have the answer by any means. But if you just think about the Occupy Wall Street movement. Occupy Wall Street is seared in our consciousness about in contemporary politics. But Occupy Wall Street really didn't last that long. It was it was a uh, it was a moment. It was a uh, as some people say it was a was it wasn't even a movement. It was a performance. It was a very brief moment in time, roughly I don't know sixty days, sixty five days, ninety days. But what's been enduring is the concept of the ninety nine percent, right? That's a new image. That's a new way of organizing, which defines winners and losers. Now I'm not saying that's the perfect way to move forward. But we have to break the consensus of the right and the left and the, the conservatives, the liberals, and think about cutting the pie in a different way. Um, as Harry said, I spent a lot of time in Spain, and I've studied Spanish politics in addition to uh, US politics. And there's a lot of fascinating things going on in Spain, including, as you all know, I'm sure the separatist movements in Catalonia. Just fascinating, but there's a huge history there. Spain's a, a relatively recent democracy. They've only been really a democracy since 1978. And they're still feeling the growing things. But, but I look at that, and there's, there's a, there was a big movement that preceded <coughs> Occupy. It was called the Indignado Movement. And now there's a political party that, that's related. It's not the same, but it emerged out of that, that energy called Podemos. They're using new language to describe the electorate. They're talking about, they're, they're not talking about the 99%, we are the 99%. They're saying we're the people and they're the caste. It's a caste system. It's, it's a fixed group, it's business and government working together, it's corrupt. You can't break into that, don't imagine that you're gonna break into that, it's a caste. We have to break the caste. We have to change the caste system. And that's just a different framing. And I'm not arguing that's the framing we need. My point is we need to think about politics in new ways. We need to take that pie and cut it differently. 
There are a lot of issues today that aren't liberal, demo, liberal conservative issues, Democrat, Republican issues. I, I've just been thinking about, look at, look at all that's taking place around sexual harassment today. Uh, when we see that uh, it's not just a conservative thing, it's a Democrat thing, it's a progressive thing as well as a conservative thing. That's an issue that transcends those, those natural boundaries that we think of when we think of consensus in US politics. So the second answer to the question, are we going blue? We're gonna go blue when we can think of new ideas, when we can put new people in place, when we can redefine politics as we know it, when we can motivate people who are now disaffected. I just saw, what was a voter turnout? There's a card here. What was voter turnout? 48%. What's going on with the other 52%? Why aren't they participating? Why are they so disaffected that that they they don't even want to participate. We have to think of new ways of approaching them, organizing people differently. So that's that's my second answer. The first answer is yes, but the second answer is we've got to do things differently, fundamentally differently. Let me let me open it up. Yeah, I, I just want to raise one of the third issues that we all we ignore in this room is that a third in Arizona, a third of the registered voters are independents, and I'm guessing when you poll, you find even a higher percentage. And yet, I've been trying to understand them, as you, as you know, Christina's been doing work and helping me. Right. It's that their issue is this top two, here in Flagstaff with our Babbitt, the top two primary. And I noticed that it's probably not going to be on the ballot this year, but, but the money will, dark money will be. Oh, yeah. Are we, are we making a decision that dark money's a bigger problem than a political system? Or what do you say? Uh, well, a couple of responses to that. First of all, um, yes. The independents are a growing, a growing portion of the electorate. Yet, those uh, we can't think that those are all going to be on the left or be progressive or Democrats. In fact, independents broke for Trump in Arizona in the last election. Uh, roughly, roughly 60 percent, according to the exit polls, roughly 60 percent of independents from Arizona who voted last election voted for Trump. So we can't assume what the politics of, is of power, because that's one, one answer. Uh, top two primary. Uh, I know Art Babbitt's been pushing top two primary. We had a referendum on top two primary. It didn't, didn't pass in the state. Top two primary, my, I, I think the, the jury is out. In fact, as, as you know, I have a graduate student doing a dissertation. I think she's going to be talking to you or something. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, I have a graduate student doing a dissertation on top two primary. And, and honestly, she's, she's doing that because the jury is out. We don't know necessarily the impact of top two. And frankly, it scares me a little to move forward with a structural change not knowing what's on the other side. So top two could backfire for progressives and hurt progressives. So I'm, I'm not personally an adherent to top two. In fact, I was against, we had this conversation many years ago. I was against top two uh, when it was on the ballot um, in Arizona. Though I know some people are pushing forward the dark money was the other issue. Yeah, dark money is a huge issue. And clearly our legislature and our elected officials benefit from that system and don't want to challenge that system. But that's that's a big issue. If anybody um, wants to know more about that, the book Dark Money is an excellent book. Yeah. Um, could you go back to the structural uh, impact, or what is the impact of the structure that we have where our legislative senators and representatives are represent are from the same district. Okay, so we have multi-member legislative districts. So two house members from each legislative district and our house districts are the same as our senate districts. Most states are single member districts. Most states have just elect one person from a, a district to serve in the house. And most states have different senate districts than house districts. So, so first of all, with the same district, if you if you gerrymander to some extent, you know, even though we have an independent uh, independent redistricting commission, if you organize legislative districts such that a party like the Republicans benefit, that that benefit gets multiplied if it's the same district for the House and the okay. Senate. And we have more Republican districts in Arizona than we have Democratic districts, the way it's been divided up. So that's, that's one point. The second point is the multi-member legislative districts. When we have two people 
chosen from each district to serve in the House. The, um, the incentive is for people to run toward the extremes, not to run toward the center. You have to distinguish yourself as a candidate. And so centrist candidates tend not to do as well in that system. And uh, I just did an analysis. This is actually, how did I do this? Last, last I don't know, sometime in the summer and the spring. If you, if you look at our legislative districts, for the, the legislative district we're in, Flagstaff consistently votes one direction, and the district consistently goes in a different direction. That legislative district doesn't represent Flagstaff, even though Flagstaff is the largest population center in that district. And that bias is multiplied twice because the legislative district is the same as the Senate district. So in those bias, so the structure matters. Yeah. Um, I was kind of interested in the top two the primaries related to the fair vote issue in any way. But that's not really my question. Okay. Um, when I, I was, um, you talked about the economy is different. How did the economy, I mean, the economy isn't an entity. And that had the fact that the, the economy is different has something to do with the politics. The politics had to make it that way. Well, yeah. And so it's a result of decisions, decisions, political decisions that have been made, and so now the economy is different. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't say you want to go back, but it doesn't seem you want to throw out consensus, the idea of consensus, and you know. Not just the polls. I don't know how you can't right. I was just I just that just struck me that the economy is this thing that moves along on its own. Right. So let me just address that briefly and, and, and then the second point about consensus, let me just say first, we could move to a new consensus in the future. You know, we're we're talking about long swings here. We're not talking about short swings. We're talking about long swings. Uh, absolutely, there can be a new consensus in the future. My point simply is that we're going to have to reorganize politics. The economy is reorganizing, and politics is going to reorganize. How is the economy? Yeah, the economy is certainly linked to politics. There's no doubt about that. But there's also broader global forces at play here, which has moved us away from um, being um, a manufacturing center, an industrial economy that we, we were at one time, to being really dependent. You know, we've closed down those factories. We're dependent on financial capitalism now. That's the core of, of capitalism for us, financial capitalism. It's the banks. And it's the, it's the risk taking that's associated with banking and finance capitalism. So there was, there, was a, there was a movement as we became more of a global world to essentially divide up the world. And, and this goes back to world systems theory and political science, to say some states are gonna be core states some states are going to be on the periphery, and some states are going to be in the middle. Some governments are going to be in the middle. So we, it used to be a more integrated economy, but now we, as you know, if you look at the, if you looked at your shirt, right, you know your shirts. If you look at the tag in your shirt, your shirts are made in Vietnam, they're made in China, they're made in Mexico, right? They're they're made elsewhere. We we've, we've taken manufacturing out of the United States, and we've put that into these semi-periphery and periphery states, and we retain the finance, the financial control. So it's, it's decisions, yeah, it's related to the, the political system, but they're broader forces at work. And my, my point was to say, we have to understand these broad forces, because these broad forces affect us. Now, we used to be an uh, industrial economy. People used to have jobs where they worked at a factory uh, and produced things, right, every day, and there were unions that represented them. That's where the consensus emerged in the post-war period. That's who we were. We don't have that economy anymore. We're not going back to that economy. Our identities are different. We're different people. And we have to recognize that part of our, the difference in our identity is we're in this more precarious state. We live in a more precarious state. We, we have few, uh, uh, Putnam talked about it years ago, like bowling alone. Yeah. We're, indi we're more individualist than we were in the past. We're not working in groups as much. We're, um, uh, we, we're not workers anymore. We're not identifying with the workplace, right? We, we have new identities, and our political system is just behind the, the curve here. We have to adjust to that. Yeah, I really appreciate your drawing our attention to 
the historical links between yeah. polarization and these structural changes in the economy. Um, I've always had a much more naive, I think, view of the uh, period of greater consensus having somehow been the product of people having a common understanding of shared threats or shared, you know, common priorities, the war, the post-war economic Absolutely. recovery. And, and maybe because of that, I've always had this hope that what we could look forward to is that someday people will wake up and recognize the shared challenge that humanity has today, for example, around environmental, global scale Absolutely. environmental change. And then I despair. Why is it that people aren't, you know, recognizing this and coming together right. around this? So, can you say a little more about um, your observation that, as a society, we really seem to be fairly centrist and have some shared values, yeah. but politically, we're not acting in that yeah. way. Yeah. No, you're right. I, I totally agree with you that the the consensus post-war consensus. So we're we're at the top of the food chain, right? We just won the war. Won the war. Our economy is thriving. Um, people are uh, have disposable income for the first time, right? There's there's a threat on there's a threat from the Soviet Union. Uh, there there's reasons that we came together as a nation. But I, I would just move that into a little different framing to say that power, power is, con, is contingent. Power changes over time. Power structures change over time. And they're always articulated in new ways. So there was a power structure. There was, there was an understanding, a hegemony. There was an understanding at that time that we had common interests. And, and those, that understanding has changed significantly over time that we don't have, uh, with the breakup of the Soviet Union, we don't have that, that external threat. With the demise of our, you know, I would say demise of our economy, fewer people have full-time employment, have secure employment, have health benefits. Uh, social welfare structures broken down. Uh, where the, the, All the messages, smaller government, not larger government. We had a larger government at that time. So all, all, a lot of things have changed. And I'm just arguing that we need a new constellation of forces. We need a new power structure that redefines what brings us together, redefines maybe the threats, re redefines who's on the inside and who's on the outside differently. Because right now, the power structure is leaving a lot of people behind. That's why we have 48% turnout in elections. Lots of people are left behind. They, they're disaffected. They, remember I said we're centrist except for trust in government? We, we don't have trust in government. We, we, we're more individualist as a, as a society. We're more consumerist as a society. Too. So we need a new structure that's going to redefine the collective will differently. We can't go back to the way it was. I'm arguing we need to go forward and find a new consent. Uh, your hands up. In your research, have you found other progressive agencies across the country that have stepped forward with new ideas or processes that have uh, taken a foothold in those independence and uh, started to make a difference. Um, that that's a great that's a great question. Um, there are a lot of nonprofits out there that are looking for ways of do, new ways of doing things. Um, I just had a conversation with uh, uh, folks might know uh, in in Arizona and in the Southwest Chicanos por la causa. And, and they're they're starting a new C4 organization, and they're like an $80 million nonprofit. They're starting a new C4 organization to get involved in politics. So there, that's play, there's, there's some energy taking place. But I would also argue, look to the social movements. Because social movement, we, we, we tend to separate social movements from the, the political system, from the electoral system. You gotta bring those together. And in fact, Going back to Laura's question, part of the, the breakup of the consensus is, is because of social movements. On the left, we had the civil rights movement, which was putting out new ideas, organizing people differently. And that led, in the 60s and into the 70s and the 80s, to a counter movement, this white backlash movement. And that white backlash movement pulled 
the Republican Party to the right. It, 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 the Democrats lost the South. The South used to be a, a Democratic, solid Democratic community, and now it's solid Republican because of that white backlash to the, the civil rights movement. So I would look to the dynamic energy going into social movements to understand what the future is going to look like. Yeah. Um, talking about that a little bit, I'm wondering if you could talk about this month's uh, election results in Virginia and around the country and um, your thoughts and connections on the midterm elections here in the state of Arizona and nationally. Wow, Virginia midterm elections. <laughs> That's a lot. Um, just a couple thoughts about uh, maybe Virginia and uh, New Jersey, and yeah, and I, I think it's um it's it's a it's great for the Democrats to hold on to something. <laughs> it's great to have a, a story to tell, a narrative that that says here's some success. You know, frankly, I, I'm a little skeptical about what that means going into the next election. Just frankly, um, the the person who was elected in New Jersey, well, there the Democrats won the governorship in New Jersey. Of course, Chris Christie's public approval ratings were the lowest I've ever seen. I don't know if they were teens, really. They might have been single digits. And uh, and so the Republican was his well, lieutenant governor, the successor. The Democrat who was elected is from Goldman Sachs. Goldman Sachs, <laughs> Goldman Sachs populates the Trump administration. Like, where where are the new ideas? I don't see that. So I'm a little skeptical uh, about kind of what what's what's a particular dynamic to a state versus what's a what's a larger trend. I, for me, a trend requires several points in time that you can stitch together and look longitudinally. Again, I think it's a great narrative. The Democrats seem to have done well in the last. <laughs> round of elections. Let's look for the trend. I don't see that yet. Uh, there's a hand in the back, and I'll come back. I have a question about potentially younger voters. My daughter is a junior over here at the university, and she's a wonderful student and has wonderful friends, but they're all remarkably unengaged in the political process. A previous speaker who spoke to this group when asked about turning out for votes at NAU said that that's not a strategy that he would recommend or would work because they just don't vote. Uh, who is that speaking? Yeah. <laughs> I'd like to know. Uh, he was the professional uh, uh, advantage. Eric uh, okay. So that, so that, you know, I, I can understand from a professional kind of consultant direction. You got to make cost benefit analysis where your money is going to be most useful. But but I would just put before you that um, yes, you're right. Historically, students at NAU haven't participated at quite high rates. In fact, now they're under assault from Bob Thorpe, right? Yes. Yes. Like, what's the messaging out there? The students not only. Don't they participate? But they shouldn't participate. That's the messaging. We wouldn't even talk about voter suppression in Arizona, but that, that's a big issue. But I will say, I will put evidence before you that student participation in 2016 at NAU was up. It was higher, in large part because of the minimum wage issue that was on the ballot in Flagstaff. And all the all of my students, all of our students, they're working. <laughs> They're working one job, they're working two jobs. They're working. Remember I said how identities have changed? We no longer have that traditional student who's uh, 18 years old, comes to college, and just focusing on college. These are students who are with families, they have complicated lives, they have one job, two job, three job. Minimum wage spoke to them. Because they, for the first time, saw that their vote could make a difference materially in their own lives. So they, they were, they, I was teaching election courses at the time, brought in speakers, their interest was peaked on the minimum wage issue. So I would argue that when the issues speak to the students, when our leaders speak to the students, students will respond. But the disaffection that we're seeing throughout our society, that, that affects our students. Our students are the precarious. They're the ones who don't see a, a, a solid future. They don't see social mobility like we saw social mobility. We've got to do something differently, and that's that was my argument. We've got to reorganize our identities, our collective will. We've got to create an argument for why you should allow participate. Uh, yes. What is the argument against compulsory voting? 
Um, the argument against compulsory voting is that we believe in freedom in the United States, and we're not going to tell anybody what to do. Yeah, but you, you can't do that with driver's license, uh, license to operate a business. But we don't have compulsory. national identity cards. So we, we're a little unique, there's, but there's only a couple countries that have compulsory voting. I know Australia, we talked about Australia as compulsory voting. They actually don't have, I, I spent some time in Australia, they don't have compulsory voting. They have compulsory show up at the elections booth. You show up, you sign in, you don't have to vote for anybody. That's, that's the concept. Of, there's only a couple states or a couple countries with compulsory voting. It's not a typical uh, um, reform, and where it exists, it tends to be just show up, but we're not going to force you to vote. I don't see that in this country. I don't see us moving in that direction. I understand the sentiment, but I just don't see the like that that mixing with the value system. Well, I didn't hear an argument against it. Yeah, the the only argument is the value structure that it, it runs against the value structure of the United of Americans, you know, who believe in individual liberty and freedom. Don't force us to do things. Yeah, we're forced to do some things, but uh, we're not happy about it. Yeah. I'm sorry. Well, people that are uninformed, you know, you know, just Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not of the camp that says some people are informed, some people are informed, and we should only let the informed. You know, really, that's saying people who think like me should vote, people who have different interests should. Have, I, I'm not of that camp. Um, I think voting should be. I think I would love to see 100% participation. Yeah. I'm going to go and ask a, a different approach to this. How much of the public good is now being served by billionaires who took advantage of this neoliberalism and became wealthier than we've ever experienced in our history? Nobody ever had as much money as Bill Gates had. And you go down the line now, there are 400 billionaires in America. And they've taken on functions of government that they are personally interested in. And it seems to me, because they don't pay taxes to the, to the right they could, that they're bleeding out public good that government could be doing instead following their own course the way they want to do it. And that that's fragmenting in ways we don't pay attention to. Yeah, I, I, I absolutely agree with you. I mean, it's, it's really, I think of it as a plutocracy. That it's, it's not only the billionaires who are in office, but they're dismantling government and they're enriching themselves. But that's part of the ethic of neoliberalism, right? That everybody, you know, should just go out and grab, or individuals, go out and grab what you can and, and use it for yourself. So my argument is, yeah, we need a new way of thinking about this, something that does limit and draw boundaries around those billionaires to say this behavior is different. One thing we're seeing in a lot of the more recent movements is the concept of morality being brought back into politics. That this kind of behavior is immoral. It's not just wrong. It's not just illegal. It's immoral. And, and again, we need new framings around this to say we need to do it a different way. We need a new collective will. We need a new ideology. We keep going back to this pull yourselves up by the bootstraps mentality. That's from the past. That's a thing of the past. We need to think in terms of the future, given all the changes that have taken place. That's, that was kind of what I was getting at with the changed economy. I mean, you brought in all the, you know, the things that have changed about it. But one thing is that we tolerate this, you know, this kind of stuff. And that, that's a choice. And our taxes, what they're, they're going to pass right now, the tax bills in the House and the Senate, both emphasize it and strengthen it by eliminating the state tax. So that means the people that I'm talking about, you're talking about, are, are going to be left alone. They're not going to even pay taxes when they no. leave their, their fortunes and, to their kids. And let's talk about the other side. Going back to the question about NAU, I just had this conversation with my students yesterday. Taxes, yeah, who cares? Like, such an esoteric, oh. I mean, we care about taxes. But generally speaking, taxes, it's an esoteric, you know, it's hard to get your hands around, it's hard to understand. My students yesterday, we had this conversation with us, they're outraged, the graduate students, that their graduate assistantships are going to get taxed heavily. And they're not going to be making, what, what, did we, what did we pay like PhD students out of 15, I don't know, 
$15,000 or something. They're going to pay, giving half of that to the federal government. They're going to be, and now they're not going to be able to deduct their student loans, the interest on their student loans. Students are incensed about that. And so getting back to the question about students, you have to find the issues, you have to find the framing that motivates them to get involved. And taxes are one of those issues. Great news. At long last. <laughs> <laughs> now I got a wrangle. What? I'm sorry? The house just passed its tax bill. Uh, <laughs> yeah, Paul, Paul Ryan lives. Uh, there's still some hands in line. Uh, you, you just answered this in part, but I want to frame the question anyway. <clears throat> you presented a good uh, case for the correlation between in income inequality and the polarization that we see right. becoming stronger and stronger. And I wonder what that, uh, to me, that income equality would lead to a polarization between haves and have nots. But we see people still voting against their self best, or their, their best interests. Uh huh. Well, and, uh, a lot of that have nots are not voting. Okay. <laughs> yeah. A lot of those have nots are very, you know, I call them disaffected. They're disillusioned. They're, they don't understand why they should participate. They're in that 52% that didn't vote in the last election. They're the students who aren't coming out and vote. So yeah, haves and have-nots, but we still have an ideology where people want to be haves, right? And they admire the haves, and they want you know they want their they want their piece of the pie for themselves. So we have to we need a new way of thinking about this. That's my whole argument. Is we need a new way of organizing the political system. We need bold new framings, whether it's about the caste or immorality or the 99%. We need to organize people differently. We have to take those have-nots who have been marginalized and bring them inside the system. Let's marginalize the billionaires. How can we marginalize and put them outside the system? That's what we have to do. Stop idolizing yeah. the media would be one way. Well, yeah, it, it runs against what we've all believed for so long. Oh, I'm sorry, and your hands no, um, going back to the recent elections, um, I would agree with you that we can't take a lot of guidance from states like New Jersey and Virginia, which have wealthy, liberal-ish suburbs, which we don't have. Uh, but um, I was more interested in the House of Delegates victories in Virginia and then yesterday, the victory in Oklahoma, uh, and it, to me that seems that it, it's evidence of if you have candidates who will speak out on issues that matter to people and candidates that uh, are not distracted by the old politics, uh, and if you have people knocking on every door, maybe we can do this. Yeah, and, and, and that's consistent with my sense that we need to reframe the arguments. We have to make the system more relevant to people. And knocking on doors is a great strategy for getting the message out there. We need to formulate the message. And I don't think we've formulated the message yet. And I think that the Democrats, frankly, are in disarray. You know, they're, they, they have not consolidated by any means. Uh, there's still factional fighting going on, and uh, and, and I, I I would put forward, and this may people can argue with this. The future of the Democratic Party is not with Hillary Clinton. We've got to find a new way, and I don't think they found that new way yet. They have to that has to be constructed. But yeah, there's hope there. I agree. There's hope. I apologize for interrupting, but I have an I got a warning before when I had to pay for two hours, so I, I can't figure them out. But anyway, I just want to uh, remind people that we have a dreamer, uh, Belen Sisa, who grew up in Argentina, uh, grew up in Arizona, but was from, uh, born in Argentina, speaking at NAU tomorrow at 1 o'clock speaking at Salsa Brava at an informal 
uh, buy your own lunch at Soul Sagrada. Right. You mean Saturday? Saturday. 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 I don't know what day it is, <laughs> but I know I'm going to pay a parking. Uh, there's still hands to run out. If, you, if, you, if you'll keep talking, they'll keep asking. <laughs> yes. I would like to suggest that one. Uh, I'm uh, realized advantage that we could have as Democrats is the Latino Mexican population, especially here in Arizona. Uh, we have a lot of people who could be naturalized and aren't yet. Um, a lot of Mexicans don't vote. Um, if, we, if we really worked on that, I think they would be overwhelmingly democratic. And um, their, their numbers are fairly large here. And growing. Yes. It's a, as I said, it's the fastest growing demographic yes. in, in Arizona. Well, and across the nation, really, isn't that true? Yeah, yeah. Particularly here in Arizona, where a third of our population are yep. Latino, largely Mexican Latino. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Other thoughts? Should I have folks split a little bit? I mean, there's some Catholic influence in, among uh, Hispanics sometimes. Yeah, absolutely. There's the anti abortion. And uh, absolutely. And so they're turned off by some of the things that they were trying to, I'm just trying to link it. Right. So we re would repel them rather than draw them in. Yeah, it's a very, um, unlike other kinds of groups like African Americans or uh, Jewish Americans, the, the, pop, the Latino population is a more divided population. Many different interests, uh, part in part, as you said, there's a Catholic influence. Uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a division between Latinos who have been here you know, for hundreds of years versus people who are just coming in. There's lots of divisions within the Latino community. So that is the fastest growing change in our population, and that is of influence today, a smaller influence, but will be a larger influence in the future. And I'm going to quit doing this, um, Structurally, I'm an institutionalist. I think that the Democrats maybe combine an institutional reform. Why not? Why don't we go for separation of House districts and Senate districts? Why don't we do for structural things that will improve the system anyhow and have our candidates say, if you elect a majority in the House and the Senate in Arizona, we'll pass this kind of bill that will make it fairer for all of us. Uh, do institutional issues ever win? Uh, that's a tough one because it's, it's, uh, it's, it's like top two. You have to show what the results are going to be. And it's hard to know beforehand. So institutional changes win. Look at what we did with voter registration. Yeah. When I first came to, to Arizona many years ago, you could only register to vote with someone who literally was deputized right, by the county recorder or the secretary of state. You didn't have this open mail-in registration. So structurally, things change, and the system can open up independent redistricting. I think that was a great issue for Arizona, um, despite the way it played out. But I think it's a great issue. We have had structural change. I think we can push for more structural change. Yeah. I think that's really a, a part of the key to the. the and Mesnar just came out. He's the Speaker of the House, and I've met him. He's a bright young thing, and he's coming up on it all this dark money. I think we can kill him on dark money. Yeah. Dark money is a huge issue. I think Juicy, people Juicy understand certainly. it too. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and and yeah. That, to me, that would be an issue. It's not restructuring the way you're saying, but it's a getting. Attention. Well, money and politics. I think that's, that's, that's a huge concern that accentuates the voice of some and limits the voice of others. I, I thought for the last year since, since that election um, that structural structure is a huge part of the national yeah. gerrymandering, uh, voters, voter voting rights, and electoral college. And I don't know what within Arizona we can do about any of those things. But, right, right. But, to me, that's that's the that's her that. Yeah. Well, with between um, uh, essentially kneecapping the Voting Rights Act and pushing voter suppression, limiting you know messing the message the students should vote, uh, uh, limiting what people can do when they um, 
how how specific their petitions have to be when they want to raise issues and put them on the ballot. The, right. the signature petitions have to be. It's very difficult to get things passed. So all the messaging today is against participation. Right. We I think we need to blow the system over, frankly. <coughs> get the trend the trend used to go the other way. How can we expand the electorate? Now it's about how can we contract. And when you contract the electorate, you cement in the current power structure. You limit the ability of change into the future. Exactly yeah. On that note. I just want to verbalize for all of us, thank you so much. We've had a marvelous lecture on political science and how we start to focus ourselves on how we think here in this room and here in Flagstaff and Coconino County about what we want these candidates that we're meeting to support. And we ought to develop our own ideas about what we think will make a difference and start working for them. And thank you. You've made a step forward here. Thank you again. Uh, so I, say, uh, I hope you'll go to the Sheba from Senate.com uh, and learn more.